When it comes to Thanksgiving games on the NES, well, there aren't any. Unless, of course, you count Joust here. And that's only because it has giant birds in it. And what is Thanksgiving if not an excuse to eat giant birds? And yes, this is a bit early for a Thanksgiving-related video, but Joust is a straightforward game and I needed script fodder. And you know what? Joust may be simplistic. And I may be scraping for facts to fill this intro with, but did you know that there was a man on the development team for Joust named Python Angelo? I think. He was born in Transylvania, designed a number of popular pinball machines, and released a project with Capcom called Goopy Hoops. Sadly, googling Goopy Hoops turns up very few results, either safe for work or not. Python was a legend, and sadly passed away in 2014. But man, what a cool name. As for Joust, well, it was an arcade hit in 1982 and was eventually ported to most platforms on the market in the mid-80s, including the popular 8-bit computers of the day, the Atari home consoles, the Lynx, and of course, the NES. The NES port was programmed by a familiar name, Satoru Iwata, who later became the president and CEO of Nintendo. As for the arcade version, well, despite being perceived as a risk due to the unorthodox controls of the time, Things turned out okay for Williams Electronics, and Joust did pretty dang well in 1982 and 83, even while competing with a pretty stacked roster of competition like Dig Dug, Donkey Kong Jr., Burger Time, and Qbert, to name a few. Heck, just look at this poster. You didn't have to be cool to enjoy Joust. You could be a tax adjuster from Milwaukee on his lunch break and still be compelled to get a few Joust reps in all by yourself. Anyway, let's see what's up with Joust on the NES. Got it! Joust! If you've never played Joust before, think Flappy Bird. If you've never played Flappy Bird before, think about panicking while drowning. It's the same feeling. You're a giant bird being ridden by a knight. You flap those wings of yours by tapping A or by holding down B. There's an art to it. It feels unwieldy at first because it is. You're a bird being ridden by a knight. But once you get the rhythm down, it becomes more wieldy, but never feels perfect. And that's where the challenge lies. Your job is to fly your knight just a little bit higher than the enemies who are also on birdback and collide with him. By doing so, your knight will vanquish their knight. Never mind that realistically being lower would be an advantage and that your knight's joust would spear the enemy's bird. Never mind that. Being even a pixel higher is what it takes to win. The game is broken into stages that loop over and over, at least in terms of level layout, but the difficulty itself slowly ramps through the addition of more enemies and faster enemies. It's a high score chaser, so there's no true game over ending, as far as I know at least. Each stage is a single screen and loops left and right with a ceiling on top. The stages change slightly after every few through the removal or addition of these rock formations. And it's maybe worth noting that although the game looks to take place in hell, according to the manual, this is somewhere in space. But anyway, one strat is to camp above the spawn point for enemy birds so you can wipe out a few to start. After you hit an enemy, they poop out an egg due to the sheer surprise of their defeat. You have a limited amount of time to go collect the egg for points, or else another bird will wander past, pick it up, 
and turn back into an enemy. If you take too long in a stage, a pterodactyl will fly into the screen like a homing missile. You have to pay attention to dodge it while you try to vanquish the rest of your mounted foes so you can end the stage. You can take the pterodactyls out, but it's tough. You basically have to aim your lance right at their mouth, which is risky. I just avoid them. There's also a monster down in the lava, but they affect the enemy birds more than you. It's a giant hand that will reach up and grab the birds, holding them in a spot for a bit, or sometimes they'll do you a favor and drag the birds down into the fire, causing you to lose out on egg points, but reducing the number of enemies for you. Sometimes, they'll just hold them in place, requiring you to chance a trip over there to hit the enemy who is bobbing around, making it a risky attempt to hit it high for the win. The regular flying enemies come in different forms. There are the basic ones you start out against, called bounders. They move slower compared to the others, and remain at a consistent height, making them easiest to target and wipe out. Then there are hunters. They are more agile and trickier to hit, as their movements are less predictable. Then there are shadow lords, and these are the toughest to outmaneuver, often forcing you to make last-second decisions on bailing out or going for the kill. Compared to the Famicom port and the original arcade version, the NES variation has more detailed graphics, but in general, the gameplay is the same. One interesting thing about this one is that if you want to hit the ground running, or rather, the sky flapping, then you just press start at the title screen to kick it off. But if you want the option for different game modes or a two-player option, you have to press select on the title screen to bring that up. That took me longer than I would like to admit to discover. The game modes, shown as A and B in the menu, only differ in that B is the harder difficulty, and that's it. You start with the harder enemies, basically. If you do play with a second player, it's a co-op affair, though you could compete for points if you wanted to. And there's also friendly fire, so to speak. Last thing I'll mention is that every few waves introduces an egg grab stage where there are no enemies, and all the platforms are reinstated, and you must hurriedly pick up all the eggs before enemy birds descend, grab the eggs, turn into enemy knights, and try to kill you. It's a good way to grab some extra points, which do result in extra lives after certain milestones are reached. If you were expecting there to be a story in Joust, well, you're in luck! The manual says that these knights are the Knights of Hyperspace! And they get along playing Joust just like the medieval knights did. They hop on their space ostriches and fight with aliens. Not for glory or fame, but for their life! That's it, you're just trying to survive a never-ending onslaught of aliens by playing space chicken with them while riding an intergalactic hell ostrich. And I have to say it, it is extremely addictive once you get a feel for the rhythm of flight. As stated, there are numerous ports of Joust all over the place. I won't cover them all here, but most hold reasonably true to the arcade original. There was a sequel to Joust called Joust 2 Survival of the Fittest that shipped to arcades in 1986, which was perhaps too late for success. Its numbers did poorly, very few were shipped, and they're now considered rare collector's items. Due to the low numbers, there are also no dedicated home ports, but you can sometimes find it on compilations. In all, Joust 2 messed with the formula too much, and despite having more graphical detail, it just didn't land with players. Well, that's going to do it for Joust on the NES. As always, ride them high, and thanks for watching.